myself. So my name is Yasmin bin Humam. I'm the co-facilitator together with Dina Borjorji of the Women's Financial Inclusion Community uh, Practice. This COP was started almost exactly one year ago in response to the greater need for knowledge sharing and collaboration in the field of women's financial inclusion. Our membership currently spans over 160 institutions around the world. Um, so we are large and growing and really keen to bring everyone together and help you share knowledge in this space. Our COP has three working groups on the topics of social norms, technology, and data and measurement. And this is the kickoff to the work program of the data and measurement working group, uh, which wanted to familiarize people with existing data, see where the gaps are, and teach members uh, how to interpret, use, and where necessary, collect their own data on women's financial inclusion. And so today is serves as an introduction to three data sets on women's financial inclusion that are multi-country, frequently collected, and publicly accessible. And for those of you who like to read, we are currently authoring a focus note on the data landscape for women's financial inclusion. And the information from this webinar, as well as the questions you pose in your uh, chat windows will inform that note. So please submit as many questions as you have in the chat box in the web browser you see uh, and make sure that they are visible to all the participants. Please also mark your calendars for October 18th, which is when we will have a special webinar dedicated to the Global Findex dataset hosted by Leora Clapper, who is also here with us here today. And after that, we hope to host webinars on the Financial Inclusion Insights data set as well as on the FinScope data set. And this will be complemented in the spring with a series on data from the supply side per perspective. For those of you who collect your own data in early November, thanks to our member Nelly Asipova from Gallup, we will have the first of our webinar series on tools and methods for data collection in women's financial inclusion. And that webinar will focus on understanding advantages and disadvantages of different modes of quantitative data collection, together with nuances of data collection in different regions. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists who are here today. You should see their pictures up on your screen, and I can assure you that um, they look just as good in person for those of them that are here with me today. Uh, Sarah Romu is a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who works across global programs within the foundation. And she's involved with the foundation's data drive for data-driven policy and advocacy and economic empowerment. And she'll provide some context uh, for the presentations you will see today. Um, Following that is Leora Clapper, lead economist. Oh, I'm sorry, I realized that you did not see our beautiful panelists, but now you should see them. Uh, following Sarah's presentation is Leora Clapper, lead economist in the finance and private sector research team of the Development Research Group in the World Bank, and she is the founder of the Global Findex. Next up, we have Nadia Vandewala, Program Manager of Financial Inclusion Insights at Intermedia, where she manages financial inclusion and consumer insights research. And last but certainly not least, Abel Moksomi, I hope I pronounced that correctly, is a research specialist at Finmark Trust, all the way here from Johannesburg, South Africa. He is project lead for the FinScope Consumer Survey Studies in Mauritius, Nepal, and Botswana, and he's also involved with the I2I platform launched in 2015, which he will tell you about. So I'll now um, give presenter rights to Sarah Romu from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who will um, walk us through our, her presentation in just a moment. Uh, Great, thank you so much. All right, so Sarah, you will have presenter rights in just one moment. <laughs> there you go. Okay. 
great. Uh, Hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, a senior program officer at the Gates Foundation, uh, focused on gender data and evidence, um, and I also work across the organization with multiple programs. Um, a little bit about our organization. We uh, we give um, just we usually have just under three thousand active grants, um, and we give about four billion dollars. Um, on an annual basis. We have offices around the world. Uh, we're based in Seattle, um, is our headquarters, uh, but we also have offices in DC, London, Delhi, Beijing, um, and some in Africa as well. Um, they're smaller size offices. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, so with the gender equality work that we are doing at the foundation, we're in the process of finalizing our strategy. So when the organization um, creates its, builds its strategy, uh, it takes a, uh, it, go, it takes a, it's usually a multi-year process. Um, but out of the gate, uh, Melinda recognized very important um, uh, areas, specifically data, um, financial um, inclusion data, and particularly women's economic empowerment. Um, the foundation is going to be focusing on two areas uh, for its major strategy, which will be healthy youth transition. Um, so looking at the opportunity um, to be supportive and provide a virtuous cycle for women to escape poverty um, as, they, as they grow up. Um, and then also uh, women's economic empowerment, which uh, looks at and supports um, uh, a lot of the financial uh, inclusion data and the analytics around financial um, inclusion um, and also looking at, uh, it supports a, a number of the, the things um, related to the work that will be shared later in this webinar. Um, the slides that I'm sharing right now are uh, the barriers to impact that we recognize that out of the gate are really important to change. And this was um, what motivated Melinda to commit $80 million to, um, to gender data and advocacy, that a lot of, um, along the data life cycle, uh, all of the, the lack of information, um, and in this case, particularly in, in consideration of financial information and information about women and girls' lives, um, leads to serious impacts and serious uh, barriers for them. Um, if, just to speak to the slide, um, it means that women's time is not accounted for, women's voices are unheard, uh, the individuals, um, if there is not the data analysis that's been done, like the financial um, data that will be shared later, uh, women's um, essentially become invisible. And so really the data in picture is incomplete. And then there's also a lack of data for women to hold decision makers accountable. So out of the gate, the way that we've um, approached some of the investments is to do uh, investments within data and measurement. And this describes some of the sub-initiatives that we're doing around that. In addition to that, uh, we are partnering with our um, financial uh, um, services team uh, at the foundation and are working to really elevate the financial services team and integrate uh, a gender lens to the work that's being done there. Um, we have, we, uh, advocated for specific individuals to be added to the team or supported on the team to support the work of partners such as the World Bank and others to uh, really um, amplify and engage the world uh, to understand the real issues around financial data and how these can be used as tools to advance women and girls for, for economic empowerment. Um, the five sub-initiatives that we have funded currently around data are around capacity and coordination, building evidence, building the global building global momentum, filling gender data gaps, 
And then also one of the things that we um, are looking at is given the spend that we do of $4 billion, um, about 500 um, grants of the two or 3,000 grants per year that we make are actually related to data. Um, and there's a lot of interlinkages that we find um, between these grants. And so really taking a look, a hard look at those grants and seeing where we can leverage other data sets that can inform um, some of the work by different uh, data um, collectors or um, people who do the analysis or advocates um, to provide a really interlinked holistic view of the reality that's being experienced by women and girls. One of the things I will touch on very, very lightly uh, is the, the importance of data that impacts the lives of women and girls across the Sustainable Development Goals, recognizing that financial uh, inclusion data is starkly not present um, in a lot of the Sustainable Development Goals or the indicators and that this is something that is so important to be collected and so necessary for women's economic empowerment. Um, this is a slide that I share with uh, our uh, partners internally regularly to show that the majority of gender-related indicators are all within Tier 2 and Tier 3, so meaning that there is no international accepted standard and data collection by most countries is either irregular or um, it doesn't get collected at all. Um, and then also, and then linking that to how this links to the current state and a lot of the um, lack of information and importance of collecting and analyzing the information about financial, um, women's financial inclusion in order to uh, achieve women's economic empowerment. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back over uh, to Yasmin. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for that great introduction. As you mentioned, a lot of national data collection efforts are um, irregular or uh, have capacity issues, and that's why we're so grateful for these data sets that we have in the room today uh, that, can, that can provide us with, with perspectives on these issues. Uh, I will now pass to uh, Leora Clapper, who will uh, present on the global index. So. Oh, just one moment. So, Leora, you should be able to select your slide now. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to participate this morning. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, global FinTech data and gender and uh, collection and data collection. Um, I lead the global FinTech uh, data effort, which collects comparable, harmonized data on the use of financial services how people save, borrow, make payments, and manage risk in over 140 countries around the world. Um, these photos actually have been taken piloting our questionnaire um, in many different regions. Um, that's me on the left for those who haven't met me. Um, other page now? Uh, so in 2000, so what made us undertake this enormous, <laughs> difficult data collection effort? Um, in 2010, there was growing interest in consumer finance and household finance. Um, how not only looking at the corporate corporate lending and borrowing, um, but also on the individual level, how people were using financial services, and more importantly, barriers. Who was missing? Who were the unbanked? Um, we were also, um, from a personal interest, um, interested in entrepreneur entrepreneurial finance, even in high-income countries. Most entrepreneurs depend on personal assets, personal savings to finance um, the uh, creation and growth of their businesses. 
and we had no comparable data. And so I show on this slide just a sample of some of the uh, available data sources. So for example, you know, we have the world of supply side data. Um, this is data uh, contributed by regulators generally from the providers of financial services. And thanks to efforts by the World Bank uh, uh, Development Research Group, by CGAP and others, um, that we had created a very nice cross-country data set on, for example, the number of ATM machines, the number of bank branches, the number of accounts. Um, this was, as I mentioned, gathered from multiple stakeholders, from regulators um, within countries. Um, however, it was really a black box, which we couldn't unpack. We didn't know who had those accounts. We also couldn't really control for multiple accounts um, on the individual level, for double counting, for foreign accounts. Um, we really wanted to be able to feel that data better. Um, as I mentioned, there, are, there were some uh, um, efforts, for example, by uh, Mixed Market, WSBI, and others to collect more detailed supply side data, but those typically were on for specific markets or countries. Um, on the demand side, for you know, there's been for a long time outstanding FINS data from FinScope and others that deep dived into financial inclusion specific markets. These were long, in-depth surveys um, that taught us a lot about that we were, uh, you know, which we really wanted to bring the race to a global scale, um, which is where we took on the global FinDEX uh, effort. So I personally couldn't manage the type of FinScope data collection effort in 140 countries. Simply, you know, the governance and uh, bandwidth is uh, staggering. Um, however, around this time, I discovered that Gallup, uh, the, pulse, uh, the opinion polling firm, had started in 2005 the Gallup World Poll Survey, an opinion poll which they were fielding in over 150 countries around the world. They surveyed over 150,000 adults around the world. This data is nationally representative on the individual level. I'll get back to it in a moment. Um, uh, they uh, randomly select strata, they randomly select PSU, um, then they do a random walk to randomly select households within households using history to randomly select an individual. So taking a step back, also around this time, the, the common way to collect data is my, with my world and colleagues was household level, right? So they thought of especially financial decisions as being something made on the household level, typically by the household head. And so the data that we had was typically household level, account ownership, saving, et cetera. But again, from the, from the beginning, this was a key criteria was that we wanted to know who was in the household had access to these services, who was in the household, um, women, younger adults, um, et cetera, had, were using, had personal savings, personal account ownership. And since starting this data collection effort, there's been tremendous amounts of rigorous academic research supporting this argument that, for example, giving a woman her offer, even just offering a woman her own bank account has a significant impact on household spending on nutritious food, on education, on health care. There's a wonderful study in the Philippines showing just offering a woman a bank account increases household spending on goods that matter to women, such as washing machines um, and other goods. And so this was our intent. Our intent was to have global, harmonized, comparable data on the individual level so that we could look around the world. We could look at countries, policymakers, researchers, practitioners, can both look within country, who at the gaps within countries between men and women, younger and older adults, rich and poor adults, as well as across their region, across their income group um, globally um, at the gap at how, for example, women um, were able, uh, the use of accounts by women um, relative to other parts of the world. Um, I should mention also that this is not an easy exercise. Uh, for many of those of you engaged in this, these are sensitive questions. They're hard to answer. There's also tremendous cross-country cultural context to these questions, which we are very cognizant of and why we've now piloted the survey in over 30 countries around the world. You know, just talking about the sensitivity for a second, you know, for example, um, and, you know, they, when, we, when you go into people's homes and ask them these questions, whether or not somebody else is in the room will affect how people answer. You know, we're very aware of questions, for example, on asking a woman, do you have any money that you save informally, maybe under the mattress for emergencies? If her husband is sitting in the room, she may not be answering accurately. 
Um, similarly, you know, I've asked questions, for example, on domestic remittances. Do you receive any financial support from other family members? I was in this one home where we saw the male household head, you know, his eyes going between his mother and his wife, and he looked at me and said, no. And this was after he had told us that his sister was working in Italy in order to support her family. And so, you know, again, demand side data is challenging, um, but we really believe um, the impact and the ability to, if you can't measure something, you can't solve it. Um, and so here is the map of the Global Findex data 2014, which I hope you've all seen. Quite excitingly, we will be publishing the 2017 data in April. We are currently in the field, hoping this map becomes a lot darker as account ownership spreads around the world. And again, highlighting that you know, we've made tremendous strides in access to accounts. Now the great challenge is the use of those accounts, especially for women, the use of uh, payments, um, the use of, I consider the most important payment of all, payments to oneself, the use of using their accounts to save, um, to uh, make payments, et cetera. Um, and also, you should mention, um, this was uh, the Global Findex project is through the generous support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and tremendous partnership uh, with Gallup. And so here, uh, simply a list of, I guess to highlight a few questions which we brought going into the data. Um, as a researcher, you know, I was trained early that every single question you ask, you should know in advance how you're gonna use that data, what sort of answers you want from that question. Um, I should also mention again, so, uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. The, uh, we, the model is um, Gallup has a world poll, which they collect data in over 150 countries, and we've actually piggybacked off of this global effort. We purchased time on this pre-existing survey and work in close collaboration with Gallup um, who has uh, Gallup staff in the field. They do all sampling, for example, is done centrally in Princeton, New Jersey. Gallup has staff in the field training the interviewers, the local vendors and their interviewers, um, overseeing data collection, all quality control is done um, in the U.S., et cetera. Um, so we really had limited space, limited number of questions we could ask. And so really, what were the questions we wanted? What did we want to learn from this data? Um, I started to mention, you know, we really wanted to highlight um, where, um, where we hope this data would uh, encourage countries to do bigger, deeper surveys, such as uh, FinScope uh, type surveys, especially on the gender dimension. Where do we need better gender disaggregated data? Um, for practitioners, how can we design, um, um, design better products for women? And really, what, so let me just give you the punchline in my limited space. I look forward to doing a more in-depth uh, webinar next month. Um, here I show the gender gap and the just simple account ownership um, for a handful of countries around the world. Um, you know, we see, for example, South Africa has virtually eliminated their gender gap, whereas in India in 2014, men were more than twice as likely as women to have an account. And this question here allowed us to dig deeper. What are women, what services do women need? You know, we see that women are making high-frequency, low-denomination payments, right? So multiple, think of multiple trips to the store over the course of a day, or wanting to save $1 a day, which just isn't, uh, isn't uh, feasible to go to a bank to make. And so how can we design the right products for these women? We also are able to um, unpack who are the unbanked, who are the women. We find, and uh, um, I'll show you next month, um, you know, that we find a tremendous percentage of the unbanked are women who are out of the workforce, which again challenges us. How do we design the right products to make sure that we uh, expand financial inclusion, both access and usage of financial services? Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Leora. I do want to highlight for attendees this, this model that Leora mentioned of purchasing time off the existing uh, surveys, which is which is something important to consider, and, and while that limits scope, obviously there are advantages to be had from that, and the scope of index is is still quite um, quite large, and and I hope that many of the people listening in today will will use it to develop um, product insights and figure out who are the unbanked in the, in the markets that they're serving. Um, with that, um, Nadia Vandawala will uh, present on the financial inclusion insights surveys by Intermedia. And also, quickly, thank you to the person who sent the question in on the chat about um, individualized surveys for smallholder families in agriculture. I would like to encourage other attendees to also not be shy and send in their questions. Even if we don't get to them today, uh, we will eventually. Nadia. Thank you, Yasmin. 
Um, as Yasmin mentioned, I am with Intermedia, a research firm based in Washington, D.C., with an office in Nairobi. We have a financial inclusion research area of practice, and one of the largest programs within this practice is the Financial Inclusion Insights Program, which is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and works closely with their financial services for the poor team and more recently with some members of the gender team. Um, we have been implementing the Financial Inclusion Insights surveys for about five years. We began in 2013, and we do these surveys in eight countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia at an annually um, with data that then becomes free and accessible for the public. So as Leora mentioned, uh, this survey is very much designed with the philosophy that we wanted individual level data rather than household. Um, and some other motivations for the FII program in particular did reflect initially, as you may notice, with those that, that specific model of focusing on those eight countries to be able to respond to and sort of measure the progress and trends in some of the countries where the financial services for the poor team of the foundation was most active. Since then, though, of course, we've expanded uh, to sharing the research and sharing analysis with other kinds of stakeholders and partners of the foundation, and, and we'll discuss that shortly. Um, we are looking at, there is a bit of a, more of a digital financial services DFS focus with this particular data set, but we are measuring informal financial institutions use, non-banking financial institutions, banks, and other things such as financial health, capacity, attitudes, behaviors, um, the use of instruments and channels, things like proximity to ATMs, phones. These are, these are long surveys and they collect a lot of data. Um, as you'll notice too with the listing for the number of interviews, we are collecting nationally representative data. So in that chart, it's on the right, you'll notice, for example, that the sample size for India is quite large, and this is in part so that we can also do subnational analysis where possible. All of the research is, of course, collected and designed with the idea to really be able to inform interventions and policy program design. Um, and so as a result, we have also incorporated the use, for example, of um, welfare, me excuse me, welfare measures based on the Grameen Progress Out of Poverty Index, which is an aspect that is unique to the FAI. Additionally, we define financial inclusion in terms of how we collect the data as when an adult uh, has a registered account with a formal financial institution. So it is a little bit different than, for example, what some policymakers define financial inclusion as uh, within their national financial inclusion strategies. Similarly, we try to look at active use and advanced active use pretty closely. And we'll look at things like dormancy from 60 days, 90 days, and 30 days. And I hope we'll have a chance uh, in a future webinar to dive a little bit more into some of the methodologies and some of the issues we also face when we collect the data that Leora flagged in Gallup's work. For example, uh, this morning I spent some time talking to our Pakistan data collection team about some issues they're having with enumerators in the field who were all male and trying to do interviews with female respondents and um, getting closed doors, so. Uh, I also wanted to speak a little bit about the kind of, how you can access the data, the kind of users that use our data, and uh, how the gender modules within the data have evolved over time. So again, as I mentioned, while initially we were really focused on the needs of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and still are, increasingly their partners, grantees, research institutions, researchers, nonprofits, donors, regulators, and central bankers uh, use the data. And one, one group that we wish were, was using it a bit more and we're aware has kind of low awareness of the data and isn't using it quite as much are providers. So that's something maybe we as a data community of practice can consider how we link those supply and demand side data sources. If you're interested in accessing the data, again, because public dissemination of the data is a huge part of our mandate, and in fact, I see my job is both collecting rigorous data, but also making sure that people know about the data and are using it. Um, there's sort of two ways. First, we tried to make a user-friendly platform for those who are maybe less familiar with data analysis um, and conducting their own studies in SPSS and Excel, and that's called the Data Finder. Uh, there's an image of what the, the URL is below, and we'll be happy to share that subsequently. And additionally, you can request from the FIA team by contacting us via that webpage a full data set with questionnaire and code plugs. 
Because of these requests and because of website analytics, we are able to track who's using the data. And as a result, we can also get feedback in terms of what we, how we should update the survey instrument year to year um, and, and how to best reflect those needs. So the gender module in part as a result of that feedback has evolved over, over time. Initially, we were actually just collecting general financial behavior information and then disaggregating the data by gender. So for example, we are looking at how access was different for men and women or whether we're looking at what mobile phone ownership, smartphone ownership looks like for men and women. Uh, in the last few years, we, act, we added a gender module with input from the, the gender team at Gates. And here we were actually only asking women questions and we were looking at empowerment, household decision making, but really final decision making and things like earnings and savings retention. Last year, uh, in coordination with the um, International Center for Research on Women and the Gates Gender Team, we actually expanded the gender module to speak to ask all. And, and so that we were having men and women ask the same question. We also looked sort of in, based on recent research that had come out uh, to break down kind of intra-household bargaining and looking at not just how men and women were experiencing decision-making differently, but who else in the household was influencing it and just how much bargaining, negotiations, and influence women could have. We also started looking at things like variation in asset control. For example, are you managing money for uh, food and health, but not so much for investment in enterprise um, or your children's education. And so we also tried to add some questions on ability to negotiate. Now again, this is just supposed to be a taste of some of the insights we can get from this kind of data, but from those 16 questions in the gender, gender module and from that disaggregation of our dozens and dozens of financial behavior questions, we are seeing increasing insights on women's experience with financial services um, specifically. And so, for example, as you can see in the chart on the right, we can look at uh, situations such as decision making um, and on, on daily purchases versus the use of households and how that breaks down for a woman versus their spouse versus parents and guardians versus a joint decision. Similarly, looking at the financial behaviors data, we also can document the gender gap as it arises. So, for example, on the left, we've shown you Kenya and India and some of the different things that are happening um, in some places where, like Kenya, the gender gap is narrowing and in other places, sorry, where it is expanding and in other places where it's narrowing, such as India, and things like active use of CFS and registered use. Overall, we find that, um, you know, being a woman has seems to be a negative predictor for advancement on the customer journey. And by customer journey, I mean access, um, and trying a financial service for the first time towards becoming an active advanced user. Uh, I'd be happy to dive more into some of the insights we find, such as you know, seeing gaps in terms of technology ownership um, and NBFI versus OTC versus registered account use, but we'll have to save that for another webinar. So um, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, thank you, Nadia. Um, uh, it's interesting to note how this data set was born out of an internal need, but moved to, then to a public audience. And I'd like also our, our attendees to, to bear that in mind as they develop their own data sets that might be of interest to the, um, to the broader public. And we look forward to learning about the expanded gender module that um, you have piloted in our, in our subsequent webinar on, uh, on women's financial inclusion. And uh, Abel, uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, my name is Abel Mutumi. I am a research and information specialist at Finma Trans. We do and we, we collect data for, from FinScope surveys. Um, from my presentation, just a quick snapshot. I want to talk a lot about data availability. There's Findex, there's FRI, there's FinScope. I think. The big question that I would like to also start pushing on is, we have the data, then what? Because that's, that's the starting point of trying to really uh, create a momentum and impact. Um, okay, um, just to start off, uh, this is just the lay of the land on the FinScope data. Uh, FinScope is also similar to Findex and FII. It's, it's nationally representative. 
Um, I think there's a lot of demand from countries, especially ministries in the gender, ministries of gender and equality. They want data at regional level because they would like to create programs that are target rural versus urban, but specific district and region. So and that's one of the reasons why school data is so comprehensive, to start answering um, needs of stakeholders. Um, over and above that, I'll have a question later on on on, on how on individual data. Um, that would be a discussion point. Um, there's a lot of data on the rural urban split. Um, we do also collect data at household level. We also have household weight so that there is a difference in reporting. Um, I think the other important distinction with FinScope is that it it it. It, it, it's a kind of a round table that brings stakeholders together. When we implement a, a film scope survey, for example, in Cameroon, we sit with the Ministry of, Ministry of Youth, Women, and Finance, Central Bank. So they are all stakeholders that sit around the table. The, the overall emphasis is that we are driving data-based uh, discussions and, and decision making. With that, we also try and provide analytical functionality. One of the things we have done now is that we've created something called an eye to eye web portal or data portal, where FinScoop data, all of FinScoop data will be housed in with analytical functionality. People will start disaggregating data, data on, on gender, rural urban splits, a regional level, and age, and all those things. So it, it helps create that functionality on segmentation. And then on, in the near future, we want to use the portal as a data curation uh, one-stop shop where we will have index data, FI data, and other independent um, surveys that are collected on financial inclusion. Um, in, in, in preparing for this webinar, one of the questions I had from the, from the host is that we need to start talking about data gap. Um, one of the questions that would always be asked is how frequent and how granular the data should be. My answer in most of the time, it depends, because it depends on who is using it and, and why are they needing. Ministries of Finance, for example, and donors and the financial inclusion community, ideally they don't uh, require data as frequent. Whereas if you start talking to FSP, the people, the financial service providers, the people who actually provide a financial account, to women, they want data as regular as possible. In one of the countries, they, they want data as, much, as frequent as six months. Because the argument is uh, the financial inclusion or the financial sector changes a lot. MNOs are starting to offer bank accounts, banks are starting to offer insurance, uh, microfinance institutes are starting to offer transactional products, for example. So they require data as frequent as possible. So this is just one of the things we'll start talking a lot on. Uh, Nadia was talking about the, the, the gender module. That's one of the things we are currently thinking through. Um, I think on the webinar where we talk about FinScope exclusively, we will then have a lot of discussion points on that, on that space. Um, I think the other point is that we are trying as much as possible to incorporate other data layers. Uh, for example, geospatial data. Uh, in the I2I portal, there is um, a tab for FSP maps, the geo, uh, geospatial data. We're still thinking through how to best map it with demand side and supply side data. We're currently running a few pilots, for example, one in Mexico, we are, where we don't, we're going to merge demand side and supply side. Um, and then one of the other things on the data gaps is people are aware of the data, yes, but they don't know how detailed is the data? For example, the kind of questions asked. Yes, they know at high level there's a gender gap of 20% or 2%, but what can you do then? That's where one of the reasons why FinScope is so comprehensive is to try and start uh, talking to that space and start answering whether exclusion, is it systematic or is it based on an individual capacity? For example, offering a mobile-based uh, solution does it mean that the, or the adults are capable of actually using a mobile device itself? So that's just start, start talking to, to, to usage. Um, I think the main other advantage of FinScoop is that we will also try and help countries and uh, relevant stakeholders to map financial inclusion roadmap. 
uh, included in the, for example, in Seychelles, I was doing a baseline survey on literacy. That starts to look at national strategies of how to include and empower women. So this is just one of the reasons why thin scope is so uh, comprehensive. Um, uh, on my second last slide, the two important things that I wanted to mention. Uh, there's always a tussle between uh, demand side and supply side. Now, one of the big distinctions is that it's hard for demand side to tally up easily with supply side for, for, for several reasons. One is that it's the unit of analysis. Supply side data is always based on number of subscriptions. So, Eagle Bank, for example, it will always tell you on the number of account holders. But, but that's just based on the number of people who have actually subscribed, right? And usage and all those things. Uh, but then if you go to another bank, they still would be able to tell you the number of accounts. But then the problem is an adult can have multiple accounts. How do you start tallying up that, 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 uh, the results? Similarly with demand size, always based on other population. Uh, it's nationally representative on adult population. So the results are very hard to convey. Um, the other thing is that one of the talking, uh, the buzzwords in the financial inclusion cycle is usage. Um, we want to look at account usage. Um, so a lot of um, the discussions are mostly based on that bank account. But then what does usage mean when it comes to savings? What does usage mean when it comes to insurance? Because you can only use insurance if and when an insurable interest is okay. So similar with credit, how do you define usage? Because you only get credit once as and when the need arises. So, a lot of the, the, the conversations are still based on bank accounts. We need to start trying to move the definitions to go beyond bank accounts, start looking at other financial products. Uh, but anyway, uh, FinScope data then starts giving you um, that kind of input. Um, I wanted to just make a comment. I won't go through this slide. Uh, I've added a few slides and addendums. Uh, that gives you links to the web portal. Uh, but one portal that I wanted to actually just talk through is the UNCDF data portal. Uh, this is also one of the portals that is housing the FinScope data, but over and above that, it also tries to go beyond that and start in, incorporating the SDGs because financial inclusion as it stands, it's a theory of change on how to decrease poverty and empower people. But linked to something, right? Um, currently, the, the UNCDF portal gives you that enough space to kind of start thinking through how does financial inclusion link up with, with SDGs. Um, the other portal we have is the i 2 data portal. It's also in this slide. Um, yes, and it's linked under your um, profile in the initial slide, which will be shared with participants. All right, good. Um, yeah. And all of these slides will be shared, I think, with the participants um, after the after the conclusion of the webinar. Um, thanks so much for that uh, overview. Uh, I think uh, uh, attendees really, I want to highlight to them what you mentioned about FinScope being developed together with stakeholders, the kind of customizability um, of this particular survey tool. Um, I think the fact that FinScope is now hosted on I2I is the first time that it's publicly available, correct? Mm -hmm. Or it has it's more been, easily, it's, yeah, it's it's more easily yeah. accessible um, to everybody. So I would encourage everybody um, to look at, look at it. Um, and it, um, it's not conducted every six months. As you mentioned, <laughs> there are some providers who would love to see data collected that frequently. Um, but I think annually is, is the most usual time frame that we see, and, and uh, there are trade-offs to be had with uh, frequency and granularity and accuracy. Can I mention one? Uh, yes, on please, that, go ahead. On that please. So different countries require data differently, right? For example, South Africa, the same group data is collected annually mm -hmm. because um, the design of the market demands the data as frequent as possible. Now, in Rwanda, for example, they're looking for such a model where data is collected annually, uh, similarly with Uganda. And then the other part I wanted to mention is that also on funding the, 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 the collection of data. In South Africa, it's funded by the private sector. Mm -hmm. So this starts talking to who is using the data. So 
it's not it's not in the donor space it's more on the financial service provider space because they are the ones who use the merit and they use the value of the data set. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway. Great. Uh, no, and with that, I'd actually like to turn uh, to some of the questions from our audience, and I'll mention two of them and then turn it over uh, to our panelists. So uh, I'll just start with these two. Um, we had a question from Jose who was surprised that the values of uh, account ownership reflected in G7 countries. And I think uh, oftentimes people are surprised by um, numbers that they're higher than expected or lower than expected, and perhaps this goes to the definitions and the understandings that people have of what an account is. And this definition even varies across your data sets presented here today, and the age cutoff for what is an adult um, varies. And so if each of you could just speak briefly, perhaps, about one of, one of the definitions that you'd like to highlight or, um, you know, what goes into making those considerations. Um, we'll uh, just go around the table. The second question um, was from Lauren regarding which surveys are good for people in the DFS plus sector, digital financial services for education, digital financial services for health. So learning about specific use of services and the use of digital payments. And I think all of these surveys speak to those um, components. And obviously, we can't get too in-depth about it, but if you could just, um, for Lauren and the other attendees, give a, a brief overview of, of how your surveys um, can facilitate um, or can give insights into this DFS plus space. So. Sure. Um, <clears throat> hi, it's Leo Rell. Sorry. Um, I'll also start with just playing devil's advocate for 30 seconds um, and why Global Findex decided to only collect data every three years. Um, well, simply because demand side data, by its nature, because it's a survey based instrument, has margins of error. And so, for example, in Findex, um, our margin of error is about three percentage points. Um, and within that band, it's insignificantly different from zero change. And so, you know, we think about the big movers in three years, over three years, are double digit growth, 10%, 11%. But on an annual basis, that's getting close to being insignificantly different from zero, um, which means that we're as likely to get plus two as minus two are both insignificantly different from zero. But having even a slight drop would be upsetting to policymakers and other, um, um, you know, market participants working towards expanding the goal and may not be realistic. I mean, financial, expanding financial inclusion is hard. Um, beyond, you know, shocks like the JDY scheme in India, we expect it to take a few years to get those big numbers. And so um, we actually encourage slightly less. I, I don't, for example, I think, you know, certainly more regular than, than annually would not be um, statistically robust. Um, in terms of definition, we use uh, the definition an account to be used to store money, to save, and to send and receive electronic payments. And so, for example, there are some, uh, you can, for example, have an MFI loan, but you're unable to save at the bank, that would not be considered an account. And similarly, there are some accounts, there, there, there are some instances where you could save money, but the account can't be used to send or receive money, that also would not count. Um, we are somewhat careful about this in the sense of we have every World Bank office in the world fill out a grid for about a dozen technical terms to want to identify those market participants who offer accounts using our definition, um, as well as a few vernacular terms like what is the local vernacular for uh, money lenders, et cetera. Um, but I think that's careful to be, to, be, to, be about, to be careful about that definition. We do not include, for example, um, SUSUs and other semi-formal um, saving mechanisms. Also because usually a SUSU, if it's an informal account, can't be used to send or receive electronic money. Um, and also, in terms of DFS, move from there to my um, segue to, so uh, to highlight, it's an account at a financial, regulated financial institution, uh, which again are identified on the country level, um, or a mobile money service account. And so our headline number of account ownership is an account at a bank or a mobile money service provider. Um, globally, in 14, it was only 2% of adults who had only a mobile money account. Um, however, in, you know, there are five African countries, including Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, et cetera, where more adults have mobile money service accounts than bank accounts. Um, I also see moving forward that where you have your accounts a little less interesting than the mode of payment. 
and use of your usage of your account. So, for example, 2017 FINDEX will be able to measure adults who use their phone uh, to make or receive a payment. Um, and I'm less interested in whether they're making or receiving a payment to or from their bank account versus a mobile money service account. It's more the ability to make a digital transaction. Um, you know, FINDEX, for example, runs through case studies of how you receive uh, remittances, wage payments, government transfer payments, sales if you're not self-employed, uh, um, or make agricultural receive agricultural payments, and how you pay school fees and utility bills. Um, but those, again, just cases. Um, and again, looking at the high level, simply whether it's sent to receive electronically versus in cash. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't want to be too redundant with what Leora said, but going to the definitions questions, we also define uh, inclusion as having a registered full service account with a financial a, a, a registered financial institution. And so as a result, there are some nuances um, that emerge when you're looking at those numbers. For example, we separately look at OTC users or over-the-counter users of mobile money, people who don't have a registered account but are using it. And, and we do see some interesting dynamics coming out. For instance, we are just piloting a survey in Cote d'Ivoire, and we see that many women might be telling us they have a registered account, but when you probe, they don't necessarily know how to use it, and they're having a family member, perhaps, you know, a teenage daughter or son helping them and doing everything on their own account. So, so what do we count that as, um, et cetera? Similarly, we um, define active use, as I mentioned, with, within 90 days. Is that really active use? That's, that's an open question for the sector. Um, and then one of the other discussions we've had is what really constitutes advanced use and how much um, can we say about welfare benefits for, of payments usage versus insurance and savings and you know, and how much do we want to really target and emphasize advanced use. Um, one thing I will add, though, is that our survey, as with some of the other ones here, also collects significant data on uh, financial behaviors. So, for example, while we are asking about those account registration numbers, we're separately also asking everybody, you know, do you save, do you borrow, with who? And we're asking some probing questions about informal providers, such as money lenders, um, SUSUs, VSLAs, et cetera. And so sometimes we see a huge mismatch in terms of what people are telling us about their financial lives and saving and borrowing versus the actual registered accounts. In terms of the question on um, DFS use cases for other sectors such as health and education, I really would recommend probing our data for that because we do collect, um, we have several questions that then probe, you know, how are you using these payments and services and specifically highlight uh, examples of education, health, for example, we had a couple of slides in our Kenya report this year on education payments through digital finance in Kenya. Um, and similarly, in some of the financial health modules, we'll ask, you know, what have you, what have you gone without or what have you sacrificed uh, when you've had some kind of financial shock? And we do see some things tied to health um, and medical expenses. So there's, there's a couple areas of overlap in different sets of questions, and I'd be happy to, to connect about some of those specific examples separately. Abel, if you want to okay. Um, I think it, it, the fee scope approach is also similar. I think the one major uh, distinction is that we go further to defining an account by who is providing it. So we just, we clearly make a distinction between those accounts provided by the bank and then other registered or oh, other registered uh, legal entities uh, that are not banks, for example, insurance companies and all those things. So. The, the main landscape of products that we really use uh, to define account ownership is the bank, uh, savings, uh, credit, insurance, remittances. And then further to that, uh, within the savings, we do ask, with who are you saving with? So there's also a further distinction between savings, uh, other registered uh, legal entities, uh, informal uh, providers like the SUSU, um, and then uh, uh, yeah, and then the rest are excluded. Um, one of the things we do just to validate the accuracy of the questions, in, within the, the questionnaire we do ask, do you have a bank account? And then we have a specific module in banks, do you save at a bank? Do you have credit? Do you have a transactional account? So if you, you, you all the, the self-correcting you know, or self-checking questions have to tick yes. So that it, it's, a, it's a form of validation kind of mechanism um, that we have incorporated in this survey. Um, and then also on the DFS space, 
we do have a lot of questions um, um, that can also define and give you a further uh, analysis on whether it's OTC or whether it's bank or mobile money and all those things. Now, one of the things I wanted to also mention is that uh, markets are developing, markets are changing so far. So one of the things, for example, in Kenya, uh, there are mobile network operators that have partnered with banks. So how do you then define that? So this, this, that's why one of the things we do is work with stakeholders, like Ministry of Finances. It helps them set the tone for policy and also to, to, to start understanding what the developments in the market are. Um, uh, Eliora mentioned the, the PMJDY uh, in scheme in India. Uh, when this thing was launched a year, uh, we were then implementing a fiscal school survey. This is just one of the things that show you that, for example, um, the, the PMJDY account within itself has an insurance product. So after you have the account for a year, you qualify for a 15% life cover and all these things. So, but the point is, this is an embedded benefit that people do not know. So in as much as people have accounts, they'll say they don't have insurance because they don't know. It, it, these are just some of the things that context always matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, yeah, that, that's my few cents. Thanks, Yeah, Leora had an additional comment. Oh, yeah. No, uh, on that note, um, I guess uh, they come up in the notes that you're writing, when you, there are some specific questions that you have to ask um, to, for the kind of disaggregated aspect. So, for example, do you have a debit card? Well, lots of women were saying yes, but then we realized we needed to go back and say, does a debit, is it in your own name right. or somebody else's name? Right. Well, no, my husband gives me a debit card to his account that I can use. Mm. And so, um, you know, because I would like to focus on ownership of, women's ownership of their own assets and access to their, you know, say, let's keep their own money. Um, you know, you really need to, when asking questions about women, you know, go that extra step to make sure they have um, the ownership over the asset as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, that leads to um, a question that we had from Grant about how how this is approached methodologically. Whether you modify the existing surveys right to be more gender sensitized, or whether you conduct a standalone gender-based survey, right, to to uh, women themselves. And um, perhaps uh, realizing that that takes time and resources and, and all of that, but perhaps um, some of you already do that to, to some extent, mm -hmm. and you can speak a little bit more about that. Um, there's also a question about if there's any interest in expanding FinScope or FII to Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so if you could... Um, I am currently running a film scope in Haiti and I'm also doing some of the pilot in Mexico. So we'll work closely with the survey that is called ENIF. ENIF? Yeah, ENIF. It's called ENIF in Mexico. Um, we're still working with a lot of, there's a lot of demand for Latin America. Uh, soon I'll be doing a lot of projects in, yeah, in, in, in those countries. Wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to the to the question of standalone surveys for women or or a more integrated approach, perhaps um, Nadia, you'd like to speak to that. Sure. Um, so we so the answer the short answer is both. Um, we we do have scope as part of the financial inclusion insights program to do follow up targeted studies in specific countries, whether they are qualitative or quantitative, and so. Um, for example, right now, we are talking about going back and diving deeper, perhaps doing some callbacks to respondents or a separate study using focus groups on, on some of these gender questions that are coming up. Um, so, so yes, we do have some scope within, within budget and within reason and, and pending support um, financially to do these follow-up studies. Additionally, we have a, I mean, it's come up a couple times on this webinar, but the data is so rich, but we only have so much time and resources to take a closer look at what is there. And um, we do have, you know, some time set aside to go back and do cross-country reports, looking at some of these gender indicators and trying to dive deeper um, on them. And then in terms of kind of customizations on an ongoing basis, uh, as I sort of rushed through, when, when I was presenting, we do try to do customizations year in and year out through stakeholder feedback at the both global to a core questionnaire, but also at the national level 
um, to capture some specific country context elements. So we do try to do a period of feedback and review each year. In terms of the data for Latin America, right now it's not really on the table, but again, that would just depend on um, somebody being interested in funding it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I would love a trip to Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think on, on the last point, on the, the, the gender module, if, if needs be, uh, we do, all fee scopes, they do ask all, so it's irrespective. But there's one other thing that I wanted to also mention. So part of the, the thing that I would like to highlight is the sampling so that it, it accounts for a lot of representativity of the women. Um, FinSCO is kind of, uh, deals with a lot of uh, a bigger sample size for, for two reasons. One, because should you want to now do a segmentation at regional level for women, you do need a lot of, uh, of the respondents. So to, from that approach, we do have a lot of data on women. So because the sample size, for example, we are running with 12,000 yeah, Rwandas, mm -hmm. yeah, so it does have data. All right. Um, well, I realize that um, we're coming up on time, and I just I do want to do a brief wrap-up and give, give the panelists an opportunity to make a, a final remark if they, if they would like to, um, including you, uh, Sarah, over there in, in Seattle. Uh, I know we have a question from Ruby on supply-side data and qualitative data, which leads me to my uh, request for all of you to stay posted with the Women's Financial Inclusion Community of Practice. We are planning additional learning events on those topics. Um, I hope you'll all tune in on October 18th for our webinar on FINDEX and our subsequent webinars on FinScope and FII. And um, I think that was it on my part. I will turn so to, yeah. On funding. Sorry? There was a question on, on, on smallholder farmers. There was a question on, on smallholder farmers, um, which, was the, which was directed at CGAP, whether CGAP would be interesting in collecting that, okay. which I will definitely pitch to them. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, at this point, uh, Sarah, um, over in Seattle, if, uh, you know, thank you for participating. And if, if you just have a, a final remark you'd like to make, then we'll go around the table to our other speakers as well. Sure. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, this has been such a great uh, opportunity to see the, the uh, just remarkable work that's been um, con continued by uh, Global Syndex um, and um, some of the other, uh, and Finmark and uh, the other uh, financial inclusion data providers. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to staying engaged uh, and um, we're really excited to see the, the use of webinars for sharing this information. Um, yeah, so, and thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, I just wanted to add that I really like what Nadia said that my job is as important to uh, disseminate the data as to collect the data. Um, all individual level FINDEX data is up on the website. Um, we're constantly trying to make it easier for users to use. And, and like the other data, so just having on the individual level gender as a variable, really encouraging you know, participants on today's webinar to go in and feel and play with the text of data yourselves. Um, FINDEX data can't be, unfortunately, um, aggregated at the sub-regional level. But can the advantages that can be, you know, raised up to uh, to be just aggregated um, on the regional level um, and global level? So mm -hmm. encourage you all to use the data as well. And this is Nadia. Um, yeah, I, I reiterate what Leora said that you know these are these are public data sets. We hope people will dive in and and reach out with um, you know their findings and their questions and and help us help you navigate the data. Um, I also just wanted to thank CGAP and Gates. We're we're so happy to be part of a community of practice that's helping improve kind of coordination and harmonization and communication between um, the supply side and the demand side and uh, what, you know, private researchers are finding on their own as well. Um, so, so please just be in touch and, and thank you all. all right. um, I think I wanted to make a, a special thank you to Gates because it seems like they're the underlying funder in all <laughs> these things because they're also funding the I2I data portal. 
to try and enhance data usage because data is available. The issue is who is using it and for what. Um, I think I wanted to wrap with two important things. Um, one of the results that was presented was on South Africa, for example, that the gender gap has closed a bit. But just to give context also, so that part of the reasons why that has happened is because a lot of welfare is sent to women, and they're the ones who are the custodians of their welfare recipients. So in South Africa, for example, the welfare is paid into bank accounts by default that makes them included because they do have an account in their name, but but context matter, so they are still dependent. Mm -hmm. So how do you help, how do you support them further? So though we do have data on all these things, we also want, we need to create a space where we also bring in the ministries and the actual policy makers and, and gender advocates to start sensitizing them to the availability of data and take the, the data forward, uh, right? Um, yeah. Thank you so much for... Well, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to all of our attendees. If I will leave the chat window open for a while. So um, for those of you still online, do feel free to send in questions while the window is open and, and you know, we will address them offline. And we will, the webinar is recorded. The webinar and the slides will be sent to um, the participants so you can re-review them and share them with your friends and colleagues and family and uh, and uh, yeah thank you all once again thank you thank you thank you, thank you.